Hey everybody, uh, welcome to our spotlight panel. Specifically, welcome to um, So Goth, She Was Born Black, a spotlight on Bianca Zunis. <laughs> your name correctly, I should have asked. Yes. Is how to pronounce your last name? Perfect. So I'm Jay Michaeline. I'm a writer, critic, and editor, and my pronouns are she, her. And today I'm happy to talk with Bianca Zunis, who actually is in this direction on my camera. And Bianca, you want to introduce yourself quickly to the listeners? Sure. Um, I'm not getting any feedback. I think when I put my bets closer, <laughs> they give feedback. But hi, um, I'm Bianca Zunis. I am a cartoonist and illustrator person based out of Chicago, Illinois, which is where I'm at now. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of what else should I say. I always feel like whenever I introduce myself, I always feel like, ah, oh, everybody's heard this before, but I always forget that people are meeting me for the first time and to include that information. So basically, yeah, I'm just like a cartoonist that f focuses on slice of life stories uh, starring myself. Um, and they usually are kind of just like the struggles of just daily life, um, relatable kind of stuff. But um, I also delve into um, heavier topics like um, police brutality and other sort of injustices that exist that I face every day. Um, and in that, it's kind of like, yeah, I focus on slice of life, but as a Black femme, like, the sort of slice of life things, what may happen in my slice of life may not happen in everybody else's slice of life. Mm -hmm. So people may think, oh, well, you do, like, political comics. That's all you do. You are a political cartoonist. And um, I'm just political because I am Black, and being Blackness is political currently in the state of the world. Um, but I just exist, and I write about what I exist through. So that was a long preamble, <laughs> but I was trying to hit all the notes. No, it's perfect. This is spotlight on you, so you get to talk about yourself as much as you want. Um, so Bianca, I was so excited to do a spotlight panel with you. I know this is a panel for a comic show, and we're definitely going to talk about your comics, but I'm not going to lie. The first thing I want to ask you about is music. Um, so in my mind, you're like the expert in residence on Gotham punk music. So what are you listening to lately? What am I listening to? Okay, so it's fall. Um, is it? It's or at least I'm, I'm the type of person that like marks fall um, because it's Labor Day. And I'm like, okay, summer's over now. Um, and I'm, I'm like a fall baby. Uh, mm -hmm. Technically, I'm a summer baby. But I love fall. I love like back to school because I'm a nerd. And um, I like to like transition into more dark wave, more somber, Halloween-y sort of ambient music as the weather changes. I feel like it fits, it fits the mood of the, uh, the season, I guess. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm, let me think. Uh, now that I'm put on the spot, uh, I am listening to Choir Boy. Choir Boy is probably one of my favorite um, fall music. Um, they also delve into some holiday topics, but they're a new band um, based out of Salt Lake City. They talk about um, in their music. They talk about them breaking away from. Um, Mormonism. Um, there's, there's a lot of like religious themes in their music, which is super goth. So um, yeah, I really love their songs. They're very like sweet and sad. And it's not, it's not like these songs are here to convert you into Mormonism. It's just kind of like we were religious once. This is our story about our faith and mm -hmm. all these things. They're, they're beautiful. Um, and then, oh boy, what else am I listening to? Uh, that's probably the one right now. Oh, and then of course, like I start really getting into shoegaze and uh, cocktail twins. Like that's really like where I'm probably headed at right now. Um, more of like Jesus and Mary Chain and um, as I keep doing my Bloody Valentine and like very like again just like slow, mm -hmm. clangy guitars and it's just like. I got really excited because, like, I spent this afternoon actually listening to punk and goth music to prepare for this. Yes. Um, and I <laughs> to Cocteau Twins, actually. 
Um, and I really liked them. And I also didn't know that um, half of the Cocteau Twins does like the vocals for a lot of like the Massive Attack songs. Yeah, pretty, um, pretty much the same band, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had like no idea. Um, but they were so great. I listened to, I listened to The Cure, I listened to Cocteau Twins, I listened to Bauhaus, I listened to Bela Lugosi's Dead, which is the only Ooh, yeah. song that I listened to, but I read that it's like the very first goth song, technically, but I'm like really excited for you to well actually me, if you don't actually think that's true. Well, actually, well, actually, um, funny note about, um, Bela Lugosi's Dead, I did a comic about it for them, mm -hmm. for Bauhaus, they asked me to do a comic um as they were they split up and they have two bands now so it's just like peter murphy travels on his own and then um the rest of Bauhaus makes up this new band called pop mm -hmm. um and they asked me to do a comic about how balagosis um is dead like how the process of how it was recorded and um, they couldn't all agree on it, all the band members. And I thought that was really funny that like Peter Murphy didn't like the way he was oh, portrayed yeah. in the comic. And then like uh, Daniel Ash was like upset about it. And so there was like, it was like fun to like be like this like nerdy cartoonist. It's like being caught in between this historic band drama. And so we ended up doing something else also like totally. Um, and you can go check it out if you're interested. Um, it's on Riot Fest um, website, and it's about their tour hearse. I know. Um, because they they end up finding a hearse to do their the tour their shows in, um, which is really cute. So I did this really cute like comic about it. That I really like. It's one of my favorite comics. So I think it's called. If you want to search it into your search bars, it's like. Um, how Bauhaus toured in a tour hearse or something like that, but okay. yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely gonna find it, and, but we'll keep talking, but I'm gonna find it. Um, so one of the other things, I mean, just since we're on the topic, um, I actually did some like reading also, um, cause I'm definitely a punk novice, like sort of actually what I, I thought was kind of cool is that I kind of discovered as I was listening to all of this stuff to like get ready to talk to you, is um, because I don't know that much about music genres. I'm not very informed about them. Um, but I kind of found out that like the post-punk stuff um, that I was listening to, I kind of, what I was coming up on, like when I was a teenager is like, I guess like post-punk revival stuff. So it was really cool to kind of listen to where all of that stuff came from in a certain way. Like what bands? Were you, what bands did you? So like when I was like a, a teenager, I was listening to, or like late teens, probably early 20s, like Franz Ferdinand, The Stroke. Oh, okay, for sure, yeah. Yeah, like a revival of that kind of vibe. And so I was like, oh, as I was listening to so much of this stuff, I was like, oh, this is stuff I totally, like A, I vibe with now, but I absolutely would have vibed with like at the time too, when I was first getting into like those things. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I was super into Friends when I was in high school. Um, I yeah. think I saw them two or three times um so and they're pretty cool i got to meet them too they're super sweet oh that's awesome i i love their first album so much it's like so incredible um which we can talk about extensively if you want but what i was gonna say was that um so i also learned that like back in like 2000 there's this british music critic dave thomas who claimed that um ann rice's book interview with the vampire which i did not know was published in 1976 mm -hmm. um i didn't realize it was that old but um, that it kind of built an audience Thomas claimed for goth rock back in like the late 70s, early 80s. And I have no idea whether that's like accurate, um, but I like the idea of kind of like a textual influence spreading out into the musical realm. And then to me, like all of your comics kind of, even if they're not about gothness, I always, I find like, I guess I feel like they have a goth feel to them, especially now that I've educated myself a little bit more about goth sensibilities. But I wanted to ask you, like, how do you see the gothness of your own work? Um, I see it with, uh, you know, I feel like as a Black person, we have a very real, especially Black American, um, have a very close relationship with death um surrounded by it and it's kind of my my family um is a family of morticians <laughs> oh wow so that's like a fun fact um not super close um like way back like uh my my great grandfather uh, mm -hmm. ran a funeral home and so um there's always kind of just been like around that like i grew up across the street from a funeral home mm -hmm. um and i love like taking pictures by the hearse and like pretending i was dead and like things like that like this but there was always funerals and like 
um, like kind of having um, like a Creole background, like the idea of like a funeral is not necessarily this like somber occasion. Um, it's like the celebration um, and kind of being like, kind of like this, all like these, because I've, I've been thinking about this a lot, like all these ideas of death um, or just things that I thought about a lot as a child and like even my own um, mortality are things that I think about a lot and I mean like you grow up where I grew up in um, the south side like um, you were just kind of used to like not your friends would die um, to gang violence or whatever it was like it was just kind of like oh over summer break you come back to school and one of your friends right in school anymore you'd be like what happened you'd be like oh they got shot and you'd be like oh wow okay and then you but you just go on you would like there wasn't like this like maybe they do a PA announcement um, and they'd be like so and so passed away we'll take five minutes but um, yeah, and I was uh, thinking about, there's a comic that I did that's nominated for an Ignatz, um, a part of Sweaty Palms Anthology. Um, and it's about, um, it's about death. And it's about sort of leaving my body and becoming like just a spiritual being. Um, and I think I, I, I think about these ideas a lot because and like one thing that I talked about with you probably which I have no problem expressing here was that I didn't I didn't want to make this whole thing about black trauma because I know especially as one of the few recognizable black cartoonists a lot of times people are just like okay and we'll ask you about race and that's the only reason why you're here is to ask you about race but I know that like even though I don't necessarily always want to focus on that as a black person, we're going to bring it up. It's going to come up because it's also just part of the ins and outs of our lives, you know, um, kind of like just like drinking water. I don't really think about it, but it exists. Um, anyway, so I, I still kind of work it into my work and with the comic that I did for Sweaty Palms, there is a popular, well, popular may, be the wrong word here, but there is a um, a book of African American fables that I used to read when I was a little girl. Um, and I can't remember the title now. Um, it was something like "We will all fly away soon" or something like that, and the and the cover always haunted me because it was this image of all of these um, African American slaves like flying into heaven and like they were free. They were finally free. Like this idea of death, you're finally free of the weight of the world. And the yeah. topic that I did was about like in death, I'm finally free of all of these things that people categorize me as and things that I don't necessarily um I'm not always thinking about like people look at me they already have judgments about me they're like there's a black woman okay here is all of the prejudice that I carry with that um and you know in African-American culture and a lot of our fables um we talk about death beloved things like that like Toni Morrison talks about this a lot in her work as well um Zora Neale Hurston talks about this a lot in her work as well just kind of just being free of all of this prejudice, being free of all of these stereotypes, being free of all of these things that people make judgment about you um, and just existing and the freedom to just exist. And that's like, that's for me, that's like the biggest thing to white privilege is that you just, you just get to be nothing. You, if you want to just not be anything, if you want to just, um, just exists not too many people are going to pressure you and be like oh why aren't you doing anything with your life or you should become something or you should do all these things there's all these pressures right um existing as a black person of having to go into this realm of um respectability in order for us to be deserved to deserve deserve to not face racism if only we are educated and have all these things and have a job and show that we're contributing to society then we deserve to live and so I just, some, I do this work where I just want to dream of the world where I'm free of all of that. And that's what I do in all of my comics. I try not to put, I try to just 
exist in my work and sometimes I get these interesting I get interesting feedback or people are just like oh my god your comics are so relatable and as a white person I relate to you enjoying to eat cherries in the summertime I relate to that as a white person I'm just like yeah because people like cherries and it has nothing to do with whether or not that black people eat cherries it's just like I exist and I try to put that in my work and I think just that freedom of existing is something that um I feel like it's something our ancestors just really wanted and I try to incorporate in my work. So I feel like this is, oh, 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 I took you guys on a ride here on how gothness and death and all these things coexist. But like, you know, you, you don't look like this and not want to just be left alone and not just to be left alone to just do what you what you dream of doing, I keep forgetting to look at my camera, what you dream of, cause I like wanna look at you. And you're down here. <laughs> and my camera's up here. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I just, you know, just to, just to be, the gift to just be and to exist and to make my work and be left alone and be left with just a sense of peace. Yeah. Um, is the I mean, I've been thinking about that. I mean, you know, we're, 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 we are definitely veering into black trauma and it's like inevitable in like a certain way, as you said. Um, I mean, I've just been thinking about it kind of in the way that we've been talking about black death recently and like the phrase rest in power, which like I understand and respect. Um, I think David Brothers commented on it recently and it was something that I've been thinking about for a while anyway. Just like, I mean, I'm so tired that like, I, I'm good to not rest in power. Like I'd be solid to just dress in peace. Peace would be very good. <laughs> seems very nice like just a solid classic r.i.p would be outstanding <laughs> yeah. Let me never, rest. please never resurrect me i would just like to rest in true peace thank you <laughs> yeah <laughs> no, I, I i definitely hear what you're saying i think what i'm what i'm enjoying about our conversation and what i what i was enjoying about listening to um all this music today was like realizing i'm like oh i do have a little goth in me I do have a little punk in me. Cool. What is it? I posted a meme today in my stories. It's my favorite. It's like my favorite meme. It's the epic handshake meme. Mm. And on one side it says goth music, and on the other side it says gospel music. And the handshake is this will all this will all be over once we're dead. <laughs> <And> <laughs> because again, like you think about even like the black church. There's a lot of we talk about death a lot. Um, <laughs> In the black church I, I don't feel like people even realize some of the some of like the weird quirks um that exist in the black church that also kind of exist in like catholicism mm -hmm. um of just like um mixing your own uh culture in with the religion because like a lot of the black culture of black churches there's there's some voodoo in there um that they that we've kind of like snuck in there and we've kind of forgotten the attachment to voodoo in, in the same way of like you know like irish catholic and a lot of like pagan beliefs in there and like catholicism has it gone into like brown cultures and like they're different like tribal beliefs and like mixing them with that like that's it's 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 in the black church and i love it um it's like something me and my mom would like geek out about and we wouldn't when like because we me and my mom are always like the the witch of the church <laughs> my mom was always like kind of exercise like as the weird one because i get this from her um this i'm not an original i'm a copy of my mother and she she was always very like holistic and like doing like woo woo stuff and they'd be like oh here goes jill and then i i picked it up so yeah i mean i really love that generational kind of stuff honestly like um it was a big deal for me when my dad was like oh yeah you know i used to listen to black sabbath and like talking heads and stuff i'm like i beg your pardon like what? <laughs> yeah. like, where where was that when we were growing up? Like, where was it? <laughs> it's not to say that I also don't have like a huge appreciation for a lot of the stuff that my parents just had just had around in the house that we were listening to as kids. Yep. But I'm kind of like, hey, it would have kind of ruled actually if you just put on a Talking Heads album when I was like eight and we could have just listened to that. Um, but I it's it's such an interesting bridge, I guess. And I think one of like the things that I think I've heard you talk about before um, and that I certainly experienced is like this kind of idea of newness culturally um, in terms of like um, 
I guess it kind of speaks to, you tweeted recently about like, you know, having, you know, white people go back to rock music. Um, <laughs> and then like, actually it's like, well, you know, that was also actually a black thing. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Oops, yeah. And like the, the, the idea that, you know, like that listening to rock music is a new thing for a new generation of black people. And actually it's been like this very old thing and that people had been doing it and that, Black people started most of these, most of these things, most of the culture things. Um, so just, I guess, the, the, the idea that it's not as new as we think and finding out all the time, just like directly in terms, like not just like history, but like in our own individual families, like finding that, that kind of stuff out. And it sounds like that was super open with your family, which I think is really cool. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I posted a few days ago a picture of my mom wearing a Black Sabbath t-shirt. Yeah. And like, we got into a big fight about it. Just, not a real fight, but like, <laughs> are you serious? Like, <laughs> it was kind of one of those moments where it was like, you give me trouble about me looking like this on Thanksgiving, but like, <laughs> here you are, mm -hmm. like, sneaking in the concerts too, like, not even paying for them. I'm like, outrageous. Um, <laughs> but kind of to, to touch a, a little bit on what you were saying before too, like, um, I have a comic about that as well. Um, also on Riot Fest. On Riot Fest, I do. I have a lot more of my um, my music stuff, and I have some music stuff on the nib as well. Um, where where I'm also nominated for another Ignatz for the uh, Be Gay Do Comics. Um, so in the same category, I'm nominated twice in the same category, so I got two shots. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I I have a comic about um, Sister Rosetta Tharp. Mm -hmm. um who like invented rock and roll like homegirl yeah. this is what she did and it was actually my dad got married um this past year not this past year in uh 2019 mm -hmm. um in may of 2019 and he lives in cleveland and so as a treat of being a good good daughter and driving out to Cleveland and being in his wedding, I was like, I gotta go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And it was heartbreaking <laughs> because like Sister Rosetta Tharp had this like little plaque that mm -hmm. was like, that was retroactively placed there as well. Like it, there was like a footnote that was like, this was placed here in 2017. And then Elvis has an entire room. And he's also the only musician in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame who has a room. Everybody else, I'm sorry if I'm getting loud, but everybody else has to share like genre space and Elvis has a room. And I was like, this is something else. And it's funny cause like there's, there's like a projection um, in the room, it takes about a wall. And I think they put the clip of either it's like Quincy Jones or Little Richard, that's just like, I can't stand that. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's Little Richie, I think is who, who it is. Yeah, I, think, like, I remember that. Yeah. That, that I, I appreciate them for adding that part, but it's such like, such worship of this man um, that basically copied the notes of all Black people. And I don't care, um, people are like, well, you know, technically, you know, he was friends with Black people and his Black friends said it was cool. Like, even if that were true um, for the era of people having mixed race friends, um, like it still doesn't make okay that so many people who actually contribute to the genre of music are completely erased for Elvis. And so right. that's my issue. But yeah, I mean like sister, I mean, in my tweet, I talk about how rock and roll um, is dead or at least it has, has quiet down um, in the mainstream because it's been completely sanitized of all um, elements of queerness and blackness. Because you got to think of Sister Rosetta Tharp was a bisexual woman, um, Little Richard, um, and I'm trying to think of other people in that era that were just kind of like, I mean, even if you think about like, we don't necessarily know all of what Prince was up to in his free time, but <laughs> they're still, he was still very queer coded mm -hmm. and that still matters. Like, and just, and how rock and roll was made. And still like black man excellently plays the guitar. Like these are things that have been removed altogether. And it's my, I feel like us as a culture today are more aware of it, that it hasn't happened to hip hop, but it's trying to happen to hip hop. And if you pay attention, you can kind of see how mainstream hip hop and pop 
hip hop that are highly popular are also done by white people and it's been sanitized and you have people like Post Malone talk about like, oh, well, hip hop isn't, you know, where it used to be and back in the day and every song that's come out today is shit where I think, you know, you look at hip hop for women um, right now is amazing. We have, I've never seen this many, like, I love, I love the fact that girls today can choose, you yeah. know, girls, boys, non-binary, like, can choose right. their faith. Yeah. And like, choose their, not like their faith and their, like, they also don't have to, like, in, in the way that, like, there's so many different ways. Yeah. Like, you, you can, you can pick your faith and that's like enough even to just have so many, but like, Maybe you vibe a little bit more of the stallion. Like you, maybe you're a little bit more of a no name. Like maybe that's like kind of where you're at. But like just the the sheer volume, I think now is so it's so great. Like yeah. it's so great to just see so many different ways of being able to be. Like it's that freedom again that you're talking about. Like not having to be constrained or not having to be you know that 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 one black woman in the room. Yeah, and I kind of feel like if rock and roll wasn't so, I didn't have so much toxic masculinity attached to it because it does. Um, it could have been saved by black women in the same way that hip hop is really being saved by black women. I saw that, I saw that, uh, was it the freshman list or whatever? And that was just a, a pure case of misogyny. I think the only black woman on there was Chica and everybody else was offbeat. Like what's his name, Blueface or whatever. Like it was just, <laughs> It was a mess. And I was like, see, the misogyny is 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 killing hip hop um, because it, it is for the girls right now. And I love it. Um, Cause I, and I, and I, and I, and that's like a secret about me. Like, even though like I'm spooky and stuff like that, like I, I love all types. I love all genres of music. I just relate the most to, to goth and punk, but like, I'm a music nerd. Um, so I write about it so much. I feel like music is such a, a healing, um, such a healing thing. I don't know what else to No, absolutely. It. Like, I mean, I think there's some things, even though I'm a writer, I guess, like there's some things that are beyond words and some things like that are beyond image. And it's like, just sound is often enough, like to like inspire a sensation. So, I mean, I'm with you. Like I, I listen to pretty broad range, I feel like of things I'm always trying to figure out. I've actually just been, been thinking about how like, I have a huge deficit in country music, actually. <laughs> probably should, like, kind of figure out. Yeah. Um, even though I'm a little reluctant. But the, o the only person that has, like, made it seem, like, interesting on the outside to me is Orville Peck. Yeah. So far, so I'm kind of like, hmm, maybe I'll listen to some Orville Peck. Uh, which I'll, I'll get around to at some point. It'll happen. Um, but, yeah, no, I absolutely hear you. Um, I was just, like, thinking about, like, who's, who's, sh who's strong and, like, rock and roll lately and like if rock and roll is like a, which of course it is a thing but like what has it become and like or maybe has it become a bunch of different subgenres like i mean would you consider like you know that post-punk revival that we were talking about earlier because i mean would you consider that rock and roll oh for sure but i, mean, even, I, I think i would now, yeah. like you don't really get that they even bands like that don't get that kind of airplay anymore like in yeah. the in the uh underground um it'll always exist because because yeah. i always feel like rock and roll is definitely rock and roll and like hip-hop are like definitely like music of the people like mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons why i love it because and that's one of the reasons why the industry um is dying a little bit because when you think of a lot of the origins of rock and roll um a lot of it was just like people in their home picked up an instrument and formed a band and it was very grassroots um, and it's not necessarily something that you can kind of um, pick pick people out of the crowd and and create this marketing campaign and then push them out to sell music. Um, okay. And that's that's a big part of why I feel like they feel like the 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 machine that runs the music, Sony and all those people, like can't can't control that. Um, sure. So that's why it's like not on, on radio play as often. But I still go to shows. I see so many, I mean, not now. Um, <laughs> definitely not now. But before COVID, I, in fact, the last thing I did was go to a show before what was, all what happened. Was your last show? Huh? What was your last show? Who did you last see? Last show I saw um, local um, band uh, Feline. Um, it's a one 
woman act. She's a she's in a synth synth pop band. If you like, if you're really into like uh like latex and like latex masks where only like this part of your face comes out and like high ponytails and like very like queer coated leather daddy sort of imagery. If you're into that, um but like synth beats. Mm -hmm. it's like very like like what is it like a, like she's always she's always singing about like sisterhood like it's great um mm -hmm. that's feline and that she was um with another um uh audio melody which is like i think he's he's either french canadian or just or from france i can't remember um but that's also like synth poppy but yeah there's a lot more um the last time I saw like rock and, like a rock and roll band, like a four piece. Um, I guess my my friends in a band called Ganser, um, they are uh, picking up some waves right now. Um, that's like that's more classic. I did a comic for them as well. <laughs> I'm right fast. <at> <laughs> you can go check it out. <laughs> and it's about how they got attacked by bees. It's really cute. It's a really cute story. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard. It's it is very like subgenre based. Like the, I'm also like really into Boy Harsher, um, which is I feel like people should check out them as well. And it's also very sort of I love I love that in the underground, um, it can go back to being very like very feminist or very queer or intersectionalities of all of those things. Um, and especially in Chicago, it's why it's one of the reasons why I like being here. The music scene here is so um care so much about the quality of the sound and the music we create and it's not that i never felt like the music scene in chicago ever felt like we're just making music for each other because we're a bunch of nerds and it kind of just feels that way when you go to shows so we're just kind of just see we're supporting our friends we're seeing shows and like that's it and people come here like four or five times a year um even more often they'll go to like LA or New York because like Chicago is such like a music city mm -hmm. um so I mean I love that and that's kind of how I, I'm exposed to things but on the radio I don't even know I don't even know what kids listen to anymore like that's I mean I joked and said like Imagine Dragons is what happened to <laughs> rock and roll um and I feel like the closest and I feel like Imagine Dragons is really pushing um praise and worship music I made a joke about that with Mumford and Sons. When I when Mumford and Sons came out, I was like, I see that rock and roll is turning into basically just praise and worship without the Jesus. <laughs> I actually really like Mumford and Sons, but I respect that taste. It still um, sounds like it still sounds rock, like you're, you're worship music. It's definitely it's definitely worship music. Like it's like it is like absolutely like it has that <laughs> vibe. And same with like Imagine Dragons definitely sounds like Christian rock to me. Like, I, I can't actually say that it's Christian rock because when I think of the songs, I don't actually hear them talking about Jesus, but I feel like in their hearts, they are. They are. Yeah, I, think, I think they're Mormon as well. And they, like, talked about that. I heard, like, a, a radio bit with them, like, a commercial, and they were talking, mm -hmm. and they had said some things, and I was like, now I'm uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> some, like, some, like, we support the queer community, you know, a sinner's not their sin or something like that. And I was like, ooh, <laughs> I don't know about this, you know. You don't like that. That is unfortunate. It was, it was borderline that. Yeah, I don't remember what they said exactly. Don't, allegedly, like, don't, <laughs> don't, don't quote me on this. I'm going to be yapping this again. <laughs> so, um, We've talked about like your work with the NIB, and we've talked about your work um, on Riot Fest, but currently you're working on a nationally syndicated comic, Six Chicks, um, along with five other cartoonists, hence the name. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, what your work uh, with that group has been like? I mean, for my part, I'm specifically interested in whether production is any different at that level, whether working in a, on a syndicated comic has like changed your workflow or changed anything about the way that you work, but how has the experience been? I wish, I wish working on a syndicated comic changed my workflow, but it hasn't. I, <laughs> I was late to this. I'm late to everything. Um, I'm on CP time all the time. Um, and then I'm on CP time on top of that. It's like Chicago people time on top of that. So mm -hmm. there's so many layers. CP time. Oh, uh, lateness. Um, and then like spooky people time, like we don't wake up till midnight. Um, 
tragic. But seriously, like I, um, it hasn't, it hasn't changed my workflow at all. I really wish it has. And I have these bursts of, I'm very, oh, like I said before, like my mother, I'm very woo woo. I'm very like, you have to just go with the flow. You have to, you have to go with your creativity when it wants to work. And when it doesn't, it doesn't. And this year, it's been a trying year. Um, yeah. Especially for the Black community. It has been a trying year. And, and you know, for the Black, brown, queer, poor, like, just working class. Like, we've all kind of just been, like, going through it. And um, I have these moments where I just can't, I can't work at all. And... Before, when I was younger, when I was a younger artist in my 20s, it was cute to burn through that and just kind of have these moments where I would just constantly push through into these parts where I would just have these burnouts that would last months at a time. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm learning, like, you kind of just have to um, work when you can and work when you, and when you can't work, you don't. Because when you like kind of overdo it and burn yourself out, it's really hard to recover from that. Right. Versus like, if you need, it's easier for me to just take a mental health day and be like, listen, girl, we're not doing anything today. We're gonna watch reruns. We're gonna just chill, burn some incense, take a bubble bath, have a cute time. Um, if I keep resisting that feeling and trying to just work past it and just keep working past my exhaustion, then when I burn out, it's going to last like weeks at a time. So it's just better just to take that day. But with working in syndication, I have to work um, in batches. I can't, I can't just do one comic a week. Even, and I feel like when I do one comic a week, I'm not funny. I, Cause I feel like you, you have the best ideas when sometimes that first comic isn't your best comic and you need to scrap that one. Right. And they keep going. Um, and they're all like one panel gag. So, um, and then sometimes that first comic, I'll realize a week later, oh, it's funnier now that I've given it time to marinate and be like, oh, I changed this character, changed their outfit, and then it'll say something else. Right. Um, but yeah, I like to work in sort of like clumps where I work, I kind of work at like six weeks at a time um, and draw them all at once. And yeah. for the most part, that works. Um, not always, and sometimes I'll need to swap things out um, due to the climate of what's going on in the world. Um, it's and and that's kind of how I got myself into this most recent situation because my comics before then, my the reason why I was um, drawn to this gig of working with six chicks um, was my editor T told me I I worked with. Um, what is it, King Features before for, I think it was Popeye's 90th or 95th anniversary, Popeye the Sailor Man. Mm -hmm. And they asked a bunch of artists to do uh, a strip comic um, for Popeye. And I did a comic um, called The Great Spinach Bake Off and it's based off the Great British, British Bake Off. And it stars Olive Oil because I wanted to give Olive Oil a chance and she's my fave. Um, all the way on Whippy. I'm like a wimpy stan as well. Um, and uh, yeah, she bakes a cake with spinach and everybody loves it. And there's a goth in it because I had to. Because uh, I was like, why not? Why wouldn't there be? Now there's a goth in the Popeye universe canon now. So um, yeah, so I did this and they really loved it. And after that, they like months later, um, had to be quite some time because this was like 2018 mm -hmm. um, or 2017. It was, it was a while ago. Um, they're like, do you, we have a slot here Tuesday. Um, would you be interested in taking this role? Um, and it's, it's quite, it's quite for quite some time. Um, I'll almost be 40 <laughs> by the time if I don't renew, um, like my contract with them, I'll probably be almost 40 if not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just like, they, they told me I could write about whatever I wanted. And I'm pretty sure at the time, when they sent it to me, I was probably complaining about something on Twitter, which is where people find me all the time. Like, we saw these tweets that you said, even though most of the time I'm saying things as a joke, people take me very seriously on that website. 
Um, Cause if you read it, it's true. And um, they asked me, <laughs> they're like, you can write about whatever you want. It doesn't have to be about black trauma. It doesn't have to be about um, police brutality. It can be about whatever you like. And I was like, and they said, but you can be political. And I, I like that. I like the ability to be right. political or to talk about tacos, like either way. And um, yeah, so most of the work that I was doing for them, um, I was just using it as an opportunity to vent or just kind of just take a break from some of my longer form pieces which are either usually pretty some of my longer form comics like on Shondaland when I had my column there are just personal works that I do um we'll talk about like identity or mental illness or or trauma or just something and some some I was kind of getting in this rut where I was like I'm getting exhausted of my own work um and so having this freedom of just going but up up but up up in all my comics felt great and um it was very the comic that uh, i'm pretty sure people are watching this and are like i know you from the comic um that was still done as just like a but in my mind right. um it was a it was a joke and i have a very I have a dark sense of humor. Um, I think you have to in order to survive. I think black people need humor um, to survive because it's not funny. Um, and yeah, I just made it uh, just like a very sort of casual and realistic experience. I was just um, back at home earlier today um, where I grew up. Um, because my partner still works out there. Um, and sometimes if I need to change the scenery, um, I'll go work in their office. And there's nobody else works there except for them. So it's not like I'm breaking quarantine, it's just them. So either I go work in that building or work in this building. And I, um, being over there, whenever I'm over there, I just like, I, I get all these ideas for all these stories. And like that woman in the comics just approaching me, um, it's just kind of something I feel like I feel like I experienced all the time. Um, it wasn't like I, and, and one thing I, I spoke about um, in this piece was I wasn't necessarily trying to villainize this lady. She was just the, the random white woman that just approaches black women randomly. It's just, yeah. I, I like literally when I was envisioning her, I was like, she's a kindergarten teacher. She talks about Martin Luther King on Black History Month. Mm -hmm. She, she means well all the time. What do you mean? She's not racist. She right. loves her biracial granddaughter. Like, it's great. And that's the woman I was portraying was these women that I grew up on the South Side who are used to Black people. Black people are not a phenomenon to them. Yeah. Um, but they're still, they still do these things where you're like, mm, but that was still racist. Mm -hmm. So even though I'm pretty sure you're a, you're a fine human being. Um, but yeah, and, and it, it blew up and people uh, did not, <laughs> they didn't like it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we, we really don't have to rehash it here if we don't want to, but like my experience of it was mostly, <laughs> I think I just read it about six times trying to see what was that. <laughs> like yeah I, I could not see it like I was like what are they mad I still don't know what they're mad about like I don't I don't know <sighs> and I guess it's funny to me because even you're explaining like you're explaining that you're not trying to villainize this person and I'm like even if you were <laughs> like first of all that would be fine but secondly like to me to me also like it that experience like I we've I've had that experience it is like to me you explain it to me I'm like no absolutely like I mean there's the, that the, just the casualness of it and I think like you you setting it in the grocery store you setting it as this kind of this almost like one and done kind of ships passing in the like casually racist night like you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean I don't, I don't know how else to um yeah, I just because well, I always, I always have old white women talking to me at the grocery store. It does, and I feel like, and I, don't, I always don't know if it was, a, it was just me. <laughs> I've been, I've been told. So one of my best friends, um, was always like, you know, you must have one of those faces because of our entire group. You are the last person I would try it with, and for some reason, everybody has time for you. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> 
everybody is just everybody deciding <laughs> for the person to just say something to. And I'm like, I guess I just have one of those uh, uh, old ladies, old ladies in, in the grocery store. Absolutely. No, for sure. 100%. Yeah. I mean, for me, at least there's nothing to explain in that comment. I don't, I'm sure many people <laughs> that didn't know that, but like that, it was a wild experience. Well, uh, no, I, in fact, speaking of, I will tell a tale on kind of related to the comic, but also not. I think it was, was it Thanksgiving? Um, I, it was either Thanksgiving or before COVID. I can't remember because my brain's all scrambled and my timeline's all confused. There was this old white woman um, at the grocery store that kept accusing me of stealing her cart. Um, and it was driving me crazy. Like, and I was, and I kept looking around like, is, is anyone else seeing this? Like, is this really? It's okay? because I'm <laughs> the darkest one here. That's the reason why you keep coming over here. And I was just like, I was picking out ingredients to make pico de gallo, because I feel like I eat pico de gallo like eight times a week. And so I'm like getting my avocados, getting my tomatoes, do 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 do, throwing them in the cart. Yeah. And she comes by and puts her hands on my cart and she's just like, this is my cart. And I'm like, no, it's not. And she looks in and she's like, oh, he, 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 my bad. It's not my cart. It is your cart. I have this grocery store so big and I get confused. My bad. I'm so sorry about that. And she walks away while still like ever like glancing over her shoulder and then walks away some more. And then like I'm in the pizza aisle. Um, and I'm like looking at frozen pizzas in the glass and she comes by again, oh. she grabs my cart. She looks at it and she's like, no, no. And then she leaves again. And then like, I see her a third time and I just like dart for the, for the, I'm like, I'm checking out. I'm done. I don't need to be here anymore. I'm not having the cop show up at Tony's Fresh Market just because this woman thinks that I stole her cart and I know that there's the only reason why she keeps asking me is because I'm like the only, like the quickest black woman she can find in this room but right it's now. also so bizarre because I mean, just in terms of mechanics, the more stuff that you shop, the more it makes clear that it's your, because you put the stuff, like I don't, I don't understand. Also, I feel like she, a lot. If, if I remember correctly, I feel like she found it at some point and was like, I found it. And I was like, I didn't even care if you found it or not. Um, good for you. I'm glad that you got your Navy beans. But yeah, why is it just a encounter occurring at all? And leave me alone. Because <laughs> the, the, the thing that I was trying to portray in this comic is there's this particular type of racism that happens between black women and older white women where it's like they're mean to you and then they'll turn around and be like but i but i like you and then turn i mean then you're racist again and then be like no 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 just kidding i and it's just like you never know which one you're gonna get and, it, and it'll switch on you when you start to trust and it's just, that, that's what I was trying to like portray where it's just like, it, it's not quite racism, but it's right on the line. And you feel like, you know, maybe after a little bit of Jesus juice, after communion, she might say something even more racist. <laughs> so just, it's, yeah, that's, that's kind of, and I, and I think I have a lot of experience with old women because I'm a freelancer. And so I go grocery shopping during old people hours because I don't like to be bothered. So yeah, I'm usually like the weird, the very strangely dressed person in the grocery store. Uh, with all these old white ladies who want to, you know, submit with their grandsons, so. <laughs> well, Bianca, you were a fashion blogger, right? I was, yeah. <laughs> you are so fucking cute at all times. <laughs> Thank when you. When first showed up for this, I just said, no, she's so cute. You actually don't know this, but, um, so I was sitting here waiting, and then I was like, no, I need to put a necklace on because Bianca, <laughs> I don't wear a necklace. I at least I'm like, I have to like keep up with her in some way. And so I'm always like, you're like, I, I'm always like wishing I could be on your level. Like your aesthetics are so like gorgeous and, and beautiful and cute. Actually, I, you've brought up cuteness a couple of times actually in a certain way that I, I've been thinking about like kind of cuteness and sort of like how it relates to Gotham Punk sort of. Cause I think Gotham Punk, um, more than some other like um, genres have like a very specific aesthetic, although I think all musical genres have a certain uh, aesthetic at a certain stage. Um, 
but I was like, I guess putting together my sense of that cuteness and how it like fits in with Gotham punk. And I was thinking about you actually talking briefly about like um, Aizawa's um, Nana recently, which I definitely think of as both like a goth, like rock um, book, but also definitely a cute work as well. And I feel like there's actually so much like cuteness in a lot of the avenues of goth and punk. Um, and I just was wondering like, do you see cuteness? And I, and, and I was gonna say also is like, I think, I think of your work as cute. Like, I think even though like, you know, throughout like, you know, you touching on, you know, going for tacos versus like police brutality versus all of these like very difficult topics. I think cuteness kind of sticks, sticks with your aesthetic and is like kind of part of the way that it works. And I do think that's very goth. Um, do you <laughs> see cuteness as a tenant of gothness or as a tenant of your own work? Um, I'm, I don't know if I see cuteness as goth excuse me, as gothness, I know that I'm looking at my Nightmare Before Christmas action figure <laughs> as I talk about this. I'm like, ah. um, and it's like next to a Mothman plush um, and a Harley Quinn doll. Um, <laughs> but like, I, I, I feel like recently um, gothness has been associated with, with sort of kawaii um, mm -hmm. imagery um, because of Lolita goth. Um, that was big in the nine. I want to say the nineties. Um, yeah. that's when the Lita goths. Nineties and like two, probably still two thousands. Yeah. Um. So there's definitely that influence. But one of the reasons why, um, I draw cute is for two reasons. One, um, is because I was raised as an anime nerd. Um, and I carry that's my cross that I bear. Um, when I was in art college, I denied liking the anime, but now that I'm a grown up, I can confess to the world today that I grew up watching anime and that I enjoyed it. And so when I was a kid, I used to take dot matrix paper, which is this paper from the past that had, um, oh, the same side, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause I used to come out of fax machines or whatever. Um, my mom was able to steal it from work and bring it to us to draw cause it was cheaper than buying us art supplies. And so I used to tape dot matrix paper to the television screen, um, which is like such an experience that I'm almost kind of sad that kids today don't even know cause like the electricity coming off of this giant television from like 1968 um, and then taping my paper on it and getting shocked by it. And I used to trace Sailor Moon episodes. Mm. Um, that way it was my light box. So that was definitely a, a, four way, a foray into drawing for me was tracing episodes of Sailor Moon. Um, but as a trick, um, my, I guess, as a witch, I trap people by drawing cute because I feel like if I draw cute, it's unassuming, like a cute little bunny in the forest. And you're like, oh my God, the bunny's so cute. And you, tr and you follow it in the forest and then a witch captures you and eats you for dinner. And that's what I'm trying to do with my work. Um, I try to like, you know, entice people by how sweet it looks and, yeah. and they're drawn to it. And then the trick is, but now we're gonna talk about systemic racism and why, in fact, you, the reader, are the problem of this. So you're going to listen to me now as I talk to this and you're like, it's so cute, I can't look away. Um, <laughs> and that's that's my goal as an artist. And I, and I, you know, for a while I, carried some shame around my art style. Um, I do wish that I was technically better, um, especially I'm working on a longer form graphic novel now and I'm definitely pushing the ends of my capabilities, but one of my biggest um, influences or at least one of my biggest um, first people that I admire would be, um, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm saying her name right, um, Julie Doucet and I feel like, or is it Doucet. I always, a uh, Doucet? Doucet? I'm not, I'm not sure. My French is, is, has gotten worse over time, but French I, yeah. I'm, her work is, I, 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 my, my work is similar to hers and sort of the, um, all of her comics are like sort of chibi looking, um, even though that's a, I'm pretty sure a thousand percent that is not what she was going for. Um, but this, there's a, there is a, I, all right, well, I guess now that I've gotten to the end of this tangent, yes, there is 
a lot of cuteness and I would say almost more in punk art because Julie's work would be would be considered mm -hmm. more punk. Um, and if you think of some of the old punk logos of bands and things like that, there is sort of this twisted cuteness to it. Um, I think what you were saying though, like kind of you're just like, oh, I'm cute and you're not going to take me seriously, but actually like I'm here to talk about some serious shit on occasion. And like that to me is very much like at least some of the stuff I was listening to and some of the stuff I was thinking about, I think specifically like Cranes. Um, like when I was like listening to her voice and like kind of like that kind of eerie almost baby doll quality to her voice um, and that I was like oh yeah because I think kind of the unassuming nature of it while also talking about something very sharp and like very kind of on the edge to me feels like that. Yeah I mean I hope I hope my work to exist as like an Annabelle where it's like this cute little doll and you want to pick it up and then it haunts you for the rest of your life. If I can do that with my comics, <laughs> then you, then yes, then I can finally rest in peace. So we're basically at the end of our time and we got through almost everything I wanted to ask. So we're, I'm going to do something a little bit different for the ending. Um, I'd like you to tell the people how to find you but I would specifically like you to tell them as though they're Keanu Reeves. <laughs> oh my God. If Keanu Reeves wants to know where to find you, Bianca, how would Keanu Reeves find you? <laughs> um, he's right there. <laughs> uh, there's Keanu's in my home, like hidden in my house. So you have to find them like Easter eggs. I feel like I wouldn't even have to tell Keanu how to find me because he would simply know based on instinct alone mm -hmm. from my pheromones where I am. You would just vibe? Latitude and longitude. Yeah, in fact, we are born, what is it? He's born on the set. We're four days apart on birth. I feel like Keanu would just, we'd vibe, yeah, we'd vibe and just, I mean, but if Keanu was like, hey, Bianca, I need you to give me something very specific so I can put into this letter that I'm sending out, I'd be like, well, Keanu, here's what I'm doing. I, you can find me at Bianca Unis, um, that's B-I-A-N-C-A-X-U-N-I-S-E, um, everywhere. So the tweets, if you want to watch me have several breakdowns at a time and then delete those later, go to Twitter. If you want to see me post very curated pictures and pieces of art, go to Instagram. And then if you don't want to see me update things frequently, then go to Facebook. Um, I'm also on Tumblr. Um, so there's a great site there of my art. Um, and that's basically it. But uh, those, oh, and then Patreon. Oh my God, that's, that's the one. I'm actually, I'm actually updating my Patreon like a few times a week. So if you, and I, I pivoted to kind of focusing on Patreon more um, because there's been a lot of support there and I want to give those people um, like in return, I want to like update the work and like put things on there. So if you want to see sneak peeks of things before they get anywhere else or process work, or you want to watch me work on this graphic novel because that's something that you're interested in, um, hit me up on Patreon starts at a dollar. I actually do a lot of stuff at a dollar because I grew up poor. So I try to be equal opportunity for everyone. We all equity. I'm all about that equity. Um, and that's it. So at Bianca Anise, find me on there and we can talk about music or Keanu or uh, Mothman um, or Glow in the Dark Bats. So yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Of course. Thank, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank thanks for everybody watching and listening. <laughs>